Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. I invite you back. I know you know that we meet at 5 o'clock tonight. Tonight is special as we kick off preacher training camp. We have a week of 14 students being with us. Um, half of them are from this congregation. The other half are from Parts Unknown, Circe, other places. And so I hope that you'll be here as we kick it off tonight. Luke's going to lead us in some singing. Noel Whitlock will be here from Circe to kick us off. And then throughout the week, the boys will be here at the building learning the art of preaching and leadership. It's going to be a great week. So hopefully you'll be back for that. How many of you have old home movies that you go back and watch from time to time? Maybe it's videos of a trip you took. Maybe you took the kids to Disney World, or maybe it's just videos of your kids when they were little, or, or your wedding. But you go back and you watch them to rehearse those events, to remember those good times. And when you watch those videos, if you're like me, you become the harshest movie critic on the planet, don't you? You watch them and you think, I hate the way I talk, or I can't believe I said that, or I can't believe I did that. And in my family, we all make fun of each other. And there's one, there's one refrain that you will hear over and over again when we as a family sit down to watch those, and it's this. Can we just rewind through this part? Because it's so embarrassing, right? It's just not something you really want to think about or look at again. Now, I want you to imagine that you sit down with God to watch a video of your life from start to finish. It's the good, it's the bad, it's the ugly. It's everything. Even those things that you thought and that you didn't know that anyone else knew about, those things that are hidden in the crevices of your soul, all of it is exposed right there on video for the two of you to watch together. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? There would be some moments you'd rather forget for sure, and there would be that common refrain, can we just fast forward through this part? But then imagine that you sit down with God and he puts in the video, and the bad and the ugly have been removed. It's only the good. For some of us, it'd be a pretty short video if you remove the bad and the ugly, right? But length is not the issue. Love is. And love is a multifaceted word, right? I love the Arkansas Razorbacks, and I love my wife. You know, I love pizza, I love coffee, I love my kids, I love this church. We love a lot of things. We love ice cream, the Dallas Cowboys, our job. We even love people we've never met. Oh, I love that Tom Cruise. We don't even know Tom Cruise. We love him. And then the concept gets even more confusing when you see it from the perspective of Hollywood. Hollywood certainly confuses us with the concept of love. Lust is love. You've heard of love at first sight. Sentimentality, feeling gets passed off as love. Those butterflies in your stomach when you meet someone for the first time, that gets mistaken as love. One may say, I feel so alive with, when I'm with him or her, or I love him or her. Why do you love them? Because he or she buys me things or because they worship the ground I walk on. You turn on the radio and you'll hear song after song expressing what the world calls love. I love you, I need you, I can't live without you. But I think you know that that type of love is not the love that is endorsed by God. It's certainly not the love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. Look with me at John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, verse 31 and following, it reads, Therefore, when he had left, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Remember, glory is a big theme for John. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am still with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are disciples of mine if you have love for one another. You ever tried to remember the Ten Commandments in order? If you're like me, I can usually do pretty well with the first few. Then it gets a little fuzzy. If you give me enough time, I can probably figure it out. Right, But it's easy to start out with, no other gods before me, do not take the Lord's name in vain. But it gets more difficult as you go along, right? What's even more difficult 
is remembering all the commandments. Because you know there weren't just 10, right? There were 613. And I had the opportunity one time to visit a Jewish synagogue on a high holy day. And afterwards, we got to ask questions of the Gabbai who performed the service. And one of the questions was, how do y'all keep all 613 commandments? And his response was, well, we don't actually keep all 613 at once. We take a smaller grouping, and we accomplish those, and we move on to the next. I guess that's one way to do it, right? If you read through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you see that there was a law or regulation for just about everything. Your neighbor's ox, tattoos, sacrificing children, the treatment of leprosy, oaths, you name it, there's probably a commandment tied to it. And as you read through these commandments, your brain may turn to mush as you process all these laws for God's people. But what can be rather mind-numbing for us was meant to be heartfelt for God's people. The Torah, which was the book of God's law, included the first five books of the Bible, but they were never intended to be just a list of thou shalt nots and thou shalt do's. Torah means instruction. So the first five books of the Bible, which we can also refer to as the Pentateuch, they were meant to be a framework for life. The teachings contained within the Torah were intended to shape God's people. The Torah was never meant to be burdensome. It was intended to be beneficial. It was God's gift to God's people, and they were to cherish it by living according to it so that they could derive the maximum benefit from it. But, as is often the case with human beings... The Israelites turned the benefit into a barrier. So by the time that Jesus arrives on the scene, the Pharisees and the scribes had built this hedge around the Torah. The 613 commandments that they were expected to keep were no longer enough. Now you had the Mishnah combined with the Torah. The Mishnah was to add a layer of protection to the Torah, and the Mishnah was the oral traditions derived by the Pharisees and the scribes. To the Jews, these traditions, although they were man-made, these traditions were on par with God's express commands that we see in the Torah. So, as you know, this resulted in behavior that was all about crossing every T, dotting every I, at the expense of writing it on one's heart. The oral traditions became like a ball and chain attached to someone's ankle. They were burdensome. And Jesus knew about the law. He also knew about the legalists who had turned the law into a prison camp, which is why he verbally butchered them, saying things like this. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, whatever they tell you, do and comply with it, but do not do as they do. For they say things and do not do them, and they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on the people's shoulders. This should be on the screen, by the way. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as their finger. Jesus' attitude toward the law was interesting. On the one hand, he seemed to ignore it, didn't he? On one hand, he seemed to ignore it. He seemed to not really care much for it. But then on the other hand... He commanded that it be followed. So which is it? It seems like, you know, Jesus may be talking out of both sides of his mouth here. Until you understand that what Jesus was doing is not condemning the Pharisees uh, uh, for following the law. It was never wrong for anybody to follow the law. That's what they were supposed to do, right? What he condemned was the Pharisees' interpretation of the law and the fact that they had turned it into something that it was never intended to be. What was meant to be spiritual had become mechanical. And that, in a roundabout way, is the context of John chapter 13, where we read a moment ago. Notice verse 34 again. I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Here's my question for you. What's new about this? What's new about this? I mean, love has been around since even before creation. It's the reason that God created us. He created us out of love because he didn't want to create robots that were mechanical. He created us because he loved us and he wanted something to love. We were built to glorify him. And when mankind failed, he loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. So this love thing, is it really something new? 
What's new about it? You can go all the way back to the book of Leviticus. And you can see in chapter 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This concept of, of loving God or loving one another is nothing new. It was around when Jesus came. It was around even before Jesus came. It was around before creation even. But here's what is new. What's new is the covenant that Jesus came to bring, the one that was sealed with his blood. This degree of greatness making this degree of sacrifice had never happened before. That was new. And do you know what happened prior to these words in John chapter 13, verses 31 and following? You know what happened prior to that? What happened? He washed feet, didn't he? Not only did he wash the disciples' feet, he washed Judas's feet, which is telling, right? This is a microcosm of the love that God has for all people, even those who don't love him. Jesus glorified God by loving the unlovable. That was new. That little word new in the Greek means unusual or unexpected. For the Messiah to wash feet, for the anointed one to serve others, for the hope of Israel and all the nations to die on a cross at the hands of the enemy. That just didn't make sense. But that's what makes it new. It's the arrival of the glory of the Lord, and thus it's the arrival of a new standard for all those who would call themselves Jesus followers. And this new standard is predicated upon love. And here's something else that is new. Jesus summed up all 613 commandments, all the Torah, all the law. He summed it all up in one statement. All the rules and regulations that you read about that can turn your mind into mush, all of that, the way that people were to be governed and to live and to breathe, they were all summed up by a simple and succinct statement. Notice how Jesus stated it elsewhere. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then notice this, upon these two commandments hang the whole law, the whole law and the prophets. Notice that last line. Upon these commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. In other words, everything that the prophets talked about, everything that they pointed to, everything that the law set forth is predicated upon loving God and loving one another. If you want to get, if you want to get this whole Christianity thing right, here's where you start. Love God, love other people. That is Christianity in a nutshell. Start there, right? Love God, love other people. Paul stated it similarly in Romans chapter 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. He's going back to the law, right? And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't have to go through all 613. He said, here's some of them, but the rest of them are all summed up in this statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul says, you want a summary statement of all the Old Testament rules and regulations? Here it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what fulfills the law. Not just following orders, not just keeping the commandments, not crossing every T and dotting every I. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And what was his primary reason for doing so? Yeah, love. This was new. For the Messiah to willingly die for the sins of mankind, even his enemies, that was unprecedented. And for his disciples... To exhibit the same type of love towards others, that was unprecedented. Let me ask you, would you rather your kids love you or do what you tell them to do? What would you rather have? Would you rather your kids love you or do what you tell them to do? Well, it's both, isn't it? I mean, it is for me. I want them to do both. I, I love my kids. I want them to love me. And because they love me, I want them to do what I tell them to do. So that brings up another question. Is your children loving you enough? Is it enough that your children love you? Not for me. Maybe for you, but that's not enough for me. I love my children to death. And I want them to love me to death. But love in and of itself is not the only thing that matters in this equation. What else matters? 
Well, the fact that they love me enough that they do what I ask them to do, that they choose love. That's what ultimately matters. And one way a chosen love manifests itself is through obedience, right? I want my children to love me so much that they don't want to disappoint me. I think that's what we all want as a parent. It's kind of like the group of teenage boys that went to dinner and to the movies, and then afterwards one of them says, you know, we ought to hit up this party down the road at so-and-so's house, and one of the guys in the group was not comfortable with that because he knew there was going to be some things there that he didn't approve of, drinking, you know, drugs, that kind of thing. And so uh, the other guys in the group were mocking him, teasing him, and finally he said, you know what, just, just take me home. And one of them in a rather mocking tone said, Why? You afraid your dad's going to hurt you? And he goes, no. Afraid I'm going to hurt my dad. That's how I want my kids to think. That's how I want to be towards God. I don't want to hurt my father. I don't want to disappoint him. That's why I follow the rules. But here's something that we need to make clear. The Bible is not a rule book. It bothers me when Christians say that. It's not a rule book. It is a story. And it's a beautiful story about redemption that starts in a garden and ends in a garden. And everything in between, everything that's couched in between is a story of God buying his people back. That's the main theme, and there's a lot of sub-themes that go along with it. But the Bible is not a rule book, and when you read it like a rule book, you miss the story. You do realize that most of the metaphors in the New Testament have to do with discipleship. They describe a relationship more than they do rule-keeping. For instance, Christ is the bridegroom, we are the bride. He is the shepherd, we are his sheep. Christ is the master, we are his servants. We are the body, he is the head. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. When you sit down to play a game, a board game, card game, whatever kind of game it is, if you're unfamiliar with the game, what's the first question you ask? Yeah, what are the rules? How do I win? That's always the first question you ask. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't play a game that if, if I don't have a chance to win. What are the rules? How do I win? And unfortunately, some people approach Christianity and discipleship the same way. But here's the problem with that. A rule-keeping mentality causes some issues. First of all, it encourages people to do the minimum. Rule-keepers love lists and checklists. And once they've done everything on the list, once they've checked all the boxes, they're done. A rule-keeping mentality breeds competition. Rule-keepers are competitive, so they're constantly keeping score. They're always looking around them to see if others are doing like them, if they're keeping up. They want to make sure that they're doing better than someone else because they want to win. A rule-keeping mentality turns Christians into police officers. Rule followers are all about enforcing the rules. They bring the hammer down when someone else is not following the law, and it's not always the rules that are found in the so-called rule book. Like the Pharisees and scribes, we've created our own oral traditions, have we not? And when they don't follow those oral traditions, some are willing to enforce some sort of punishment. A rule-keeping mentality creates a sense of entitlement. If I follow all the rules, then I get to go to heaven. It's a performance-based religion. If I do well, I get to go to heaven. But Jesus talked about doing right things. However, I didn't know you, he says. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Rule-keeping disowns grace in Scripture, and the story of Scripture is saturated with grace. A rule-keeping mentality can easily turn us into the very people that Jesus railed against. Now, give me your eyes. Hear me when I say this. Do not walk out of here this morning saying, Chris, we don't have to follow the rules. In fact, Chris said that there's not even rules in the Bible. If that's what you get out of this lesson, you need to listen more carefully. The Bible is full of rules. There are commandments to be followed. Not just in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well. And Jesus expected those to be followed. In fact, there were consequences for not following them. All I'm saying is, you don't get the cart before the horse. You don't start with rules. You start with relationship. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? If you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me. Which implies that you can keep the commandments, but if you don't love me, what's it really matter? Paul talked about that too, didn't he, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Just a clanging gong if you're not doing it for the right reason, if love is not present. 
So here's the question that's on the floor this morning. Why should I do it? Why should I do it? Why should I love? Because I'm commanded to? Can you be commanded to love? Absolutely you can. Those of you who have children, you go love your sister. You can be commanded to love, but is that the only reason you do it? Is that the only reason you love your neighbor? We have to decide if our heart will follow the command. Commandments can be followed or not followed, but love is the decision to let the emotion follow the command. Is just following the command enough? Well, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Jesus didn't just want rule followers. He wanted relationship seekers. It's not enough just to cross every T and dot every I. The relationship is what means anything because it's in the relationship that we find life. And it's because of the relationship that we follow the rules. Read through 1 John sometime. It's a treatise on love. In fact, let's look at some of it right now. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God was revealed in us, that God has sent his only Son into the world so that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, by this we know that we remain in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. By this... Love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, we are also in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar, for the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen, and this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. God is love. God is not loving. Love is not something that is a part of him. He is not composed. God is not a composition made of parts. Nobody composed him. He is God. And God is not loving. God is love. Right? So if you want the perfect definition of love, you go to the definition itself. You go to the source, right? God doesn't just do love, he is love. And love is not about emotion, it's not feeling or sentimentality. Love is who we are, at least it should be. Love is is defining. It is a verb. It's what you do. In fact, I would say it like this. The love you give horizontally is a product of the love you get vertically. Or to put it another way, abiding in love equals abiding in God. God has put you into a family to facilitate love. If you are not a loving disciple invested in God's family, you are walking in darkness. That is John's message. John says as much in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, The one who says that he is in the light and yet hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. Your purpose in this family is to facilitate love. You start there. You are to facilitate the well-being of another. And one of the primary ways you do that is through love. The reason that God adds you to the church is so you can be in a context where you can practice love. If that's not who you are, then how can the love of God abide in you, right? It sounds like I'm being a little uh, harsh or firm Maybe because I feel like this church needs that. No, I think, that, I think we do this really well. We can always love more, but I think we do this really well. It's just a reminder for our prospective members, our new members, and even our core members that remember who we are. 
This is all about love. It predicates everything that we do. You know, when I was in junior high school, the junior high that I went to was a historical marker in Paragould, Arkansas, which means it was really old and should have been torn down. But anyway, we were going to school at this big three-story building, and we didn't have air conditioning, which meant it was a hot box during August and September, and in the winter wasn't much better. Every room had radiators. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So in the dungeon, as we called it, there was this huge boiler filled with water that would heat the water, and it would come up through the radiators and heat the room, not very well, but it would do so nonetheless. And every so often, I would slip down into the dungeon in the boiler room, and I would peek in with my friends because they had rats down there, biggest cats. And we just thought it was fascinating to look at those. But anyway, in, in this boiler room, there's this huge boiler. And on the outside of the boiler was a little tube. Maybe you've seen these. It's a little tube. And that tube had water in it. It was an indication of the water level in the boiler tank. And the reason it was there is because you, you couldn't look inside the boiler tank. I mean, it's too hot. You, know, you had to climb up on a ladder to look into it anyway. So you had this little tube as an indicator of how much water was in the tank. I don't know how much Jesus you have in you. I've got an idea with some of you. I, I don't know how much Jesus you have in you. You don't know how much Jesus there is in me. But there's a tube. There's an indicator, isn't there? You know what it is? Love. The love you show is an indication of how much Jesus is in you. I am giving you a new commandment, Jesus said, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus is basically saying, you're the ad agency. You're a walking billboard for Christianity. The effect of this commandment will be the major advertisement for Jesus. Your love will be the calling card for Christianity. When people see you acting outside of yourself and loving like Jesus, they will have no doubt as to who you belong to. When they see the indicator and they see that you are filled with Jesus by the love that you show, it's going to pay ultimate dividends in the world and in the mission. So what are we doing here? That's the question we've been asking over the last few weeks. What are we doing here? Well, we're loving. We're sharing life through sharing love. That's what we're doing here. We are seeking to give people more of Jesus so that we can get more of him as well. That's what we're doing here. So the question on the floor this morning is, why should I love? Why do it? Why should I love? Is it because I want to be a rule follower and go to heaven? Well, maybe partly. But primarily, it's because I'm a relationship seeker. So let the relationship drive your actions. Let the love of God, the love of Jesus that you give horizontally be a product of the love you get vertically. You need some love this morning? This is a loving family. If we can pray with you, if we can encourage you, We've got elders here, staff, that would be glad to meet with you. If you want to study the Bible with someone, if you're contemplating what that next step is, and you're ready to put on Christ in baptism, we're willing to do that this morning for sure. You have no excuse to leave here this morning without being right with God. Let us help you. Kevin's going to lead us in a song. Why don't you come as we stand and as we sing?